American Public Media. Victor Kofi Mallet and Bafor Asayama Eje met as students at MIT six years ago. They were both engineering majors, but the school's annual business plan contest had caught their eye. Bafor says that contest pointed up a big difference between doing business in Ghana and America. Even if I can't trust you on a personal level in America, I know the laws will work in our favor. There will be justice. He says Ghana's legal system lacks protections for business people, and that makes it dangerous to partner with people you hardly know, even if they're really talented. To just say, hey, let's go and meet in the conference room and you can be my lifetime partner, I thought that was a cool and weird idea. Bafor and Victor didn't win MIT's famous 50K business plan contest, but they did learn about forming teams and evaluating ideas, about how good ideas get funding and advice. They decided to launch a similar effort to inspire entrepreneurs back home. The first prize is $5,000 in seed capital. The Ghana New Ventures competition was Victor and Bafor's takeoff on the MIT contest. And the team that was awarded this prize is Supply Solutions. It was launched in 2002 and ran for three years. The contest was a hit in Ghana. It even spawned several imitators. But entrepreneurs there face tough obstacles. Victor says even teams with good skills and ideas face barriers you don't often find in America. In Ghana, if you do not have a strong connection to somebody with money, as in a family relative or a friend of the family, you're pretty much out of luck. There is no appetite for risk. Still, Victor and Bafour had planted some seeds. Then they headed back to the States in the next phase of their plan. Okay, now we're washing the fresh cucumbers. They've picked up two African-American business partners, Stan and Christine Coleman. The Colemans have a secret recipe for pickles. Their small-scale production line starts with crispy cucumbers, a cutting board, and sharp knives moving quickly. Here. You need all your fingers. <laughs> Victor and Bafour, still in their 20s, add a dash of business acumen to the Coleman's secret recipe. The product is called Philly Fresh Pickles. They're now in 13 stores and three restaurants around Philadelphia. A line of olives is planned, and production's moving to a less labor-intensive plant. Everyone involved still works their day jobs, but it's no accident that Victor and Bafour chose this business line, because the final leg of their entrepreneurial game plan points straight back to Ghana. Victor sees Ghanaian mangoes, pineapple, and cocoa products as well-positioned to crack world markets, so doing specialty foods here is part of the learning curve. Bafour also sees their journey heading towards something bigger. The goal is actually to be a big entrepreneur who will be able to drive Ghana's development. So the only way I see it, short of becoming the head of the Bill Gates Foundation, is <laughs> to start off my own company to do it. Victor says the things they've done to spark Ghana's entrepreneurial ecosystem are essential for developing countries. Entrepreneurship is really the only way I see to control your own path and to also provide opportunity for other people. It's a passion. I mean, it's one of those things that once you catch the bug, it's really hard to turn your back on it. And maybe this wasn't part of Victor and Bafour's plan, but if your interim step is a pickle and condiment business, there are worse places to start one than Philly. After all, didn't a little company called Heinz get its start not too far from here? I'm Steve Tripoli for Marketplace. American Public Media. Procter & Gamble has 9,000 researchers in its R&D unit. Sounds pretty formidable. But worldwide, 200 times that number are researching the sciences that go into P&G products. Every one of them is a potential rival. P&G Vice President Larry Houston says if he can't beat them, sign them up. What we've come to recognize is that we really need to be thinking about all the terrific people that are outside, be they individual entrepreneurs and, frankly, even our competitors. So P&G launched a program called Connect and Develop to corral outside thinking. The company will buy ideas and market-ready products. They'll share their secrets if you'll share yours. Both sides get a chance to use ideas that can further their research and profits. And this isn't just about P&G. Tech giant Intel sunk $265 million into startups last year. Microsoft, Nokia, and others are also on a buying, backing, and partnering binge. So are drug companies. 
A big winner on the small company end is Millennium Pharmaceuticals outside Boston. On a recent visit, a robotic arm was shuttling potential cancer drugs between tests. Millennium was a four-person startup just 13 years ago. Its strength was hard science, not business. So the founders married their brains to big drug companies' marketing bucks and regulatory clout. Now Millennium has 1,100 workers and loads of research, marketing, and distribution partnerships. Research and development head Bob Tepper says the drug giants gave his startup critical tools for growth. First, obviously, they've provided us with revenue. In addition, pharmaceutical companies also helped us by teaching us about the processes that were important in this regulated environment. So we can use their might all over the world with some of our precision, and that's a great combination. This kind of matchmaking almost demands a prenuptial agreement. Small business people especially might be tempted to give away the store in exchange for that shot with a big partner. Henry Chesbro of UC Berkeley's Center for Open Innovation says entrepreneurs need to hold their cards close. The small company has to be realistic about the motivations of the large company. Don't show everything that you know. Show a little bit until you can actually craft an agreement that does protect some of your interests. Chesbro says big companies do have incentives to play fair. If they get a reputation for hogging the profits, no one will partner with them. And even giants are afraid of relying on just their own R&D shops for future growth. I'm Steve Tripoli for Marketplace. American Public Media. Success killed Kristen Sundberg's business. That's right, killed it. How? I realized that I couldn't really follow through on what I'd promised. She was making simple lavender sachets out of her home in Tampa, Florida. They're those small linen bags stuffed with lavender that add a nice smell to closets and drawers. It all started at her sister's wedding shower, but took off fast. Specialty shops caught the scent, then big department stores. That simple home business was soon outrunning Kristen Sundberg's dream of a cozy cottage industry. I had, you know, hefty bags of lavender <laughs> in my apartment and vintage linen hanging everywhere. Shipping, billing, and marketing chores piled up. I don't know, I guess there just wasn't enough time in the day. She wasn't mentally ready to take on hired help and hadn't thought about finding financing. So it turned into this just, you know, crazy situation of me running around <laughs> doing all the work and just, you know, not feeling stable, I guess. Everything just seized up and Sunberg's jet-propelled startup collapsed. She was depressed about how things turned out and disappointed with her own lack of planning, but also relieved to just go and get a day job. Out in San Rafael, California, Marketplace listener Mike Van Horn sees this from two angles. He runs his own successful startup, and that business is advising small businesses. So with that resume, his startup must be a model, right? I've made every mistake in the book. Including, you guessed it, not handling the growth that success brings very well. He says he failed to delegate, didn't do enough marketing, and was slow to implement new strategies. The problem Van Horn sees in himself and many clients who are succeeding is what he calls the Lone Ranger complex. They think they have to do everything. They've got to wear all the hats. You know, I'm the expert, the business is moi. That's just a habit up in your head that you've got to be willing to let go of. He says if you really want to be a Lone Ranger, then do that. But know in advance if your plan is to grow or stay small. That's where Kristen Sundberg stumbled. So now let's turn to our small business expert for this series. Patty Green is provost of Babson College. She's written extensively about entrepreneurship. Green says Kristen Sundberg and Mike Van Horn both struggled with turning from the creative side of their businesses to the business side. But she says there are two ways to look at creativity. Creativity or innovation is actually not just in figuring out what's the coolest lavender sachet you can possibly have, but it really is about all the other pieces of putting the business together. And if you still don't want to sweat details like marketing or distribution? That's the time to think about a partner. Green says lots of schools and small business programs are great at teaching how to launch a business, but lousy at teaching entrepreneurs what to do next. She says that's got to change. I'm Steve Tripoli for Marketplace. American Public Media. If Kevin Knauss hadn't come up short on the engineering front, you might have been hearing the sound all over California by now. He developed a new kind of remote controlled lawn sprinkler system. Knauss could manufacture, install, and market it. 
But this system needed a design tweak to please big customers, and for that, Knauss needed engineering skills. He says that crucial missing talent sunk his company. The chief lesson from me is you need to be able to step in and do that job, because if you don't, you'll get caught flat-footed like me to a certain extent. Out in Kalamazoo, Michigan, Todd Holmes' startup crashed when it ran out of money. He was making a heated sleeping pad for campers. Holmes says one reason his capital ran out is that he didn't use it wisely. I concentrated on more of the selling aspect with the capital, getting the product out there. And I think what I probably would do more now is take a different approach and maybe do a little bit more research and product development. Both cases show how hard it can be for small business people to anticipate needs. Kevin Knaus, the sprinkler inventor, says that tells him to put more effort next time into identifying those needs. First, do a business plan. And within that business plan, look at the areas that you know very little about and see if you could develop the background and the education to do those. So let's turn to our small business expert, Patty Green, from Babson College. She thinks Kevin Knaus is being too hard on himself. Sure, he was burned by not having the engineering skill his business needed, but Green says that doesn't mean he has to personally learn every job in the company. I think that's something that can hold people back, is thinking that they have to be the absolute expert on everything instead of understanding where the other resources are that can help them. Because, face it, you can't know everything well enough to make this all work, not if you really want it to grow. Green says Todd Holm, the camping guy, may be right to think he spent too much early money and energy getting his product to market. Research, development, and industry contacts count, too. And that's, I think, where business planning comes into it, is figuring out what's the order of when do you go to the trade shows, when do they have to see the product, all those types of things, and then laying out your plan to follow it through. And finally, some lessons from listener Rachel Carter in Fort Bragg, California. She's a land developer who regrets that an early failure scared her away from real estate for years. At the end of the project, I should have viewed it, that I'd learned a lot in what was next. And instead, what I learned from it was that it was too hard and I didn't want to do it anymore. Carter also wishes she'd sought help much faster when she was sinking. So plan against your weaknesses, use startup capital wisely, and draw lessons, not fear, from your failures. These listeners are making my job easy. I'm Steve Tripoli for Marketplace. American Public Media. Report co-author Erland Bullwag says that after 9-11, Europe's rate of new business formation went way down and stayed there. But Americans are already back to starting businesses at pre-9-11 rates. It means that this culture of entrepreneurship is much stronger to withstand fluctuations. So there is a mechanism of entrepreneurship is so strong that it just shifted focus to other areas of activity. Bullwag, who's a business professor in Norway, says the dot-com crash left American entrepreneurs similarly unfazed. He says these quick rebounds show that adversity just gets Americans looking elsewhere for opportunity. You keep looking and you keep trying. Americans start far more new businesses per capita than most major industrial countries. And the Gem Report says more of these startups force business in new directions. That pressures established businesses to change or be flattened. American entrepreneur Jim Poss makes street-side waste containers that feature solar-powered trash compactors. They crush the trash so more fits in. His Seahorse Power Company claims the containers cut costs because they need less emptying. Poss worked for companies that do business abroad. He says America's abundance of entrepreneurs and venture funders who don't flinch at failing is unbeatable. The difference is that people are really willing to go out and take a risk, and that other people are willing to bet on that. German emigre Gina Maschek runs the internet florist Beyond Blossoms. She says launching her business here was far easier than it would have been in Germany. Entrepreneurs are much more supported here. With support, I mean, you know, the whole system, like the tax law. Another thing is that there aren't as many schools over there that really teach business. This society appreciates people starting from scratch and becoming successful versus in Germany, it's not regarded positively. America's future atop the entrepreneurial pile is no sure thing. Countries from Ireland to India are learning to copy the U.S. model. Then there are the social risks. The GEM report says U.S. policymakers need to help workers cope with the job losses that flow from our business model. Candida Brush of Babson College says health care is another risk. She says paying for it is a big worry even for entrepreneurs who find it easy to start a business here. 
but it's not as easy to grow. And this is where the healthcare issue kicks in. For a, a growing business in the US, it is a cost. It's an additional cost that would inhibit their ability to compete in the global marketplace. If those problems languish and workers get fed up, the report warns that they might push policies that slow America's business launching juggernaut. And today's news is a reminder that political risks like new terrorism remain a wild card. I'm Steve Tripoli for Marketplace. American Public Media. A young company called Mophie in Burlington, Vermont, leases a cool high-tech gadget called a 3D printer. It's just what the name implies. You design a product on your computer, hit the print button while the design's on screen, and a printing head shoots out hair-thin streams of hot plastic instead of ink. It's like an oven inside, one with a glass door where you can watch what's baking. And then after it cooks in there, you take it and you stick it in this bath. In minutes, a soft plastic prototype of the product is in a cooling bath. Shortly after that, you can hold it in your hand. And here's some stuff we cooked last night, and now we're playing parts of Mophie makes iPod accessories. It's a competitive business expected to hit the $2 billion mark this year. So company founder Ben Kaufman uses the 3D printer to do something businesses once only dreamed of. With a new line of iPods just out, Mophie was able to have new accessories production ready within a week. Maybe that's why Kaufman's teachers occasionally let him cut class. I'm not missing class to, you know, go party. Kaufman's a sophomore at Champlain College in Burlington. When you're 19 years old with a full course load and a million and a half venture capital bucks in your pocket, well, even partying has to wait. It's no coincidence that Kaufman took the startup he launched at home on Long Island to this school. You can jump right into your major on the first day of your first semester rather than taking all those core classes that I would be incredibly bored with. Champlain has launched a program called BYO Biz. It works this way. Students who bring their business to Champlain or start one there get flexibility with school requirements. They also get active mentoring and regular meetings with Vermont business veterans. They help with everything from strategy to networking with venture capitalists. Ben Kaufman's advisor is business professor Robin Lane. She says students like Ben face an interesting juggling act. Here he's trying to start this really exciting business and he has homework. One of the things that we really wanted to do was make sure that his academic work is as compelling as his business work. And that's a tall order. I mean, when your business has you like going off to China, your, your classes are going to have to be real interesting. BYO Biz aims to help more students become entrepreneurs and help Champlain attract more students. The hope is that students who bring their businesses to Vermont will keep them there. College President Dave Finney came up with the idea. He hopes a strong presence of student entrepreneurs will stir the school's intellectual ferment. It unleashes people's imaginations about what's possible, and it's not normal or not usual for someone to think, you know, I'm going to go to college, but I'm also going to grow my own business, and when I get out, I'll have a job because I will have created it. Over by the Lake Champlain waterfront, BYO Biz students Pete Jewett and Pete Brune run an eBay consignment shop called Go Trading Post. They specialize in antiques, but will take most anything someone wants to sell on eBay and handle the auction for them. Old posters, uh, vintage electronics sell great. Pete I mean, and Pete get a cut sell, of the proceeds. Pete Jewett says BYO Biz stocks. lowered his startup costs. We can go into school and say, this is where we're at. You know, get free advice that we don't have to pay for that otherwise would be charged hourly. And also, we can get employees without setting up payroll, workers' comp, in the form of interns. So the program helps student startups, and the startups give other Champlain students business experience. Sophomore Ben Hollenbeek owns two businesses, a photography studio and an online bike parts store. Hollenbeek says BYO Biz helps students to bridge part of the entrepreneurial learning curve. He says most other business students first go to school and then head to the workforce to make their rookie mistakes. I'm skipping that. I'm getting the workforce experience while I'm having my education. So when I'm done here, there won't be that gap for me. We have that cushion, the failure at a discount, where if I had screwed up some of this stuff and having not been the sort of comfort zone of college, it could have been a lot more severe than it was. Starting this year, Champlain's recruiting high school students specifically for BYO Biz. College President Finney says he'd like to see the program spin off two to four Vermont-based businesses a year. It may not sound like a lot, but in a state with only 600,000 residents, that kind of business formation adds up over time especially if two kids like Pete and Pete turn out like two other Vermont entrepreneurs named Ben and Jerry. I'm Steve Tripoli for Marketplace. 
American Public Media. The spray guns are busy these days at Mike Shipstead's business. His shop in Santa Clara, California specializes in spray-on plastic coatings for pickup truck beds. Things are good now, but for a couple of years, Shipstead operated closer to the edge. You know, people asking for payment and not enough customers coming in and you're wondering why the phone's not ringing. He says deciding whether to go on when times are tough is like flying through fog. His test in those times was to ask himself three questions. Is there an opportunity to grow? Can we get there as a business? Do we have the people and the resources? And then, I guess thirdly, do I want to go there? As long as he answered yes to all three, he kept going. A couple of towns away, lawyer Christy Prinz is an entrepreneur by necessity. The law firm where she was nearing partner status collapsed. Launching her own practice has been rough going. Her test of whether it's time to pull the plug has more to do with stress levels. She's seen other struggling entrepreneurs feeling so desperate they were falling apart. And I think if I had ever gotten to that point for more than a day, <laughs> then at that point I would have perhaps decided to throw in the towel. In Dundee, Michigan, listener Paul Perdue's internet-based business has folded. A load of debt and a long scramble for new cash ended with a potential investor's verdict. His words to me the second before I turned to my wife and said, we're going to have to close this, were we had dug too deep of a hole. So three people whose businesses cover the range from failed to hanging on to thriving. But Paul Perdue, Christy Prinz, and Mike Shipstead draw startlingly similar lessons about avoiding that pull-the-plug decision. Perdue, whose business went under, speaks first. Watch costs and understand what you could not be spending. Tighten up the capital, tighten up the collections. In the end of the day, there's no business unless you have the money. I think what I've learned is start with as little overhead as possible. So getting and handling startup money really matters. Entrepreneurs tend to be optimists who have a hard time pulling the plug. That's why our small business expert, Patty Green, says someone they trust should monitor decision making. Whether it's a spouse or a partner or a parent or a business partner, whatever it might be, but for them to remind you that this is the bottom line on what you can actually afford to lose. It's not just about money. It's about what you can take emotionally and even how the business is affecting relationships. So Green really likes Mike Shipstead's three questions. Is there an opportunity to grow? Can we get there? And do I want to go there? Because they include not just about the business, but about him personally. Green says your three questions don't have to be the same. Just be sure to have your personal pull-the-plug measuring stick. I'm Steve Tripoli for Marketplace. American Public Media. Oh, if they could just start over. In Seattle, Daniel Hornell creates and sells personalized ringtones for cell phones. You're hearing one now. He's been searching for startup capital, and like many entrepreneurs at this stage, he's beginning to second-guess the way he's done it. Well, I'd start earlier. I wish I had talked to more people earlier. I wish I hadn't operated under the illusion that I wouldn't need a lot of capital. Hornell's startup is cash-starved, and his increasingly urgent money chase is sapping energy he needs to fend off ringtone competitors. Because somebody else is going to do it, and somebody who's got some advantage of you over you is going to do it. Big startups can grab venture capital, and tiny ones get government help. But Hornell says many cash-seeking small businesses are stuck in between. Back up. <laughs> In Berthoud, Colorado, Monica Signer and her partners sold their own assets to launch their dog kennels and riding stable. After that, they carefully tapped so-called friends and family money. Signer recognizes that borrowing from acquaintances carries special burdens. You want to make sure, obviously, you don't want to jeopardize your friendship, and you want to make sure to be able to honor your commitments. What was very successful for us was to wait until we knew that we had income coming in before we approached an acquaintance. On Long Island in New York, Brian Prince runs two web-based businesses, a search engine and an online hotel reservation site. He says when he's seeking capital, there's no substitute for feeding potential investors loads of well-written details. Mapping out the actual business strategy, how you plan on protecting the funds to make sure that you don't just burn through them. Not a business plan, but more of an overview of the idea. Our small business expert for this series, Patty Green from Babson College, says Brian Prince is giving potential investors something extra with all those details. 
in reality, he's selling himself this way as much as he's selling the idea of the enterprise. He's selling that he's thought through what are the risks, what are the contingencies. And Green says that Daniel Hornow, the ringtone guy, is learning a hard lesson by having an up and running business with no financing pipeline in place. You should be thinking about always having your pipeline kind of planned out in your head. But it means you have to really understand what are you trying to get done, and then you can figure out how much money do you actually need. One last thought from Brian Prince on Long Island. He says it's smart to get your investors deeply involved. Have them be mouthpieces, evangelists for the business, get them using the business, have them telling their friends and family about the business, involve them in the business of marketing, of sales, of feedback. After all, what better resource than people who literally have a stake? I'm Steve Tripoli for Marketplace. American Public Media. So this is the master suite with the retreat. Rocky housing market and all, Rachel sure. Carter loves being a real estate developer on California's North Coast. She handles the design work and enjoys showing her properties. I do all the surfaces and the color choices. That's really my love. When things got busy for Carter and her partners, everyday office work started piling up. Hiring help solved that problem and let Carter do more of what she likes. But she admits that having someone else depend on her success adds a layer of unease. I felt like all of a sudden I had the responsibility of another person who was paying their bills from my paycheck. In Alpharetta, Georgia, listener Thomas Orff says adding staff adds other discomforts. His business cleans and repairs fine rugs, and he's had lots of frustration trying to get workers who do it to his standards. That's not the only problem. Just the amount of paperwork and Social Security tax filings and employees complicate that. But a third listener says you've got to remember the upside of employees. Mike Van Horn's small business in San Rafael, California, is advising small businesses. He says you can't grow without employees, first of all, and they free you for vacations, the chores you enjoy, and even illness. The problem Van Horn often sees is business owners blindsided by a need for workers who then make bad decisions. They hire somebody without adequately considering whether it's a good fit, and then it's not a good fit. And so then they think, oh, I can't get any good help, so it just proves that I should have stayed doing it all myself to start with. But that doesn't get you anywhere. So Van Horn says many entrepreneurs should get help getting help. Hire someone who knows how to find workers who fit your business. Our Babson College small business expert Patty Green says entrepreneurs have three things to consider when contemplating that first hire. She says Rachel Carter, the real estate developer, is right. The first thing is that being responsible for someone else's livelihood really does change things. Secondly, how you use your own time has to change because this person has to learn about you, about the venture. And the third is it's a different skill set. Different because you have to weigh other people's needs, how their talents fit in, and because now you have to constantly remember that your own example is setting the company's culture. Thomas Orff in Georgia says that even in his specialty business handling fine rugs, he's learned to loosen his grip on workers. I think the expectations are what need to be controlled in hiring people. You cannot expect them to be little mini-me's. That's ultimately the bottom line. So that fateful first hiring decision comes down to two common decisions for business owners. Know what you want out of your business and figure out how to get there, preferably before the need comes crashing down on your head. I'm Steve Tripoli for Marketplace. American Public Media. They don't talk to each other very often, and so they all feel like they're the individual, that they have to figure it all out themselves. Where in reality, if they talk to each other and share what they've learned, a lot of this could just be avoided and move on to the next mistake or the new mistake. Okay, so what forums are out there for entrepreneurs to share their ideas, their wisdom? really depends where you are. And that's why I think this is not only a, an individual entrepreneur question, it's actually a, a policy question. It's an economic environment question. So in some areas, there's excellent, excellent chambers of commerce, connecting them, not just one entrepreneur to another, but to the rest of the community to support entrepreneurship, the bankers, those who would provide debt capital, angels, having angel networks, and then there's a number of um, national programs, too. I've been a, a longtime advocate of the Th Athena PowerLink program. This is for women entrepreneurs, but it helps create voluntary boards for them for a year to help them hmm. learn better about what they might do right and what they might do wrong. 
Well, I guess some of the qualities that you have to have to be an entrepreneur, I would think you'd have to be pretty idealistic or optimistic, but that can also be a liability. So how do you balance those two things? I think you temper your, your enthusiasm by having a set of metrics that we, we talked about in the series as well, by really knowing where your business is. Uh, I remember there was one entrepreneur years ago I worked with who didn't keep financial statements. And if there was money in the drawer, the business must be doing okay. <laughs> and if the drawer was empty, they were in trouble. You know, obviously not the right way to run a business. But is it the case in starting a small business that you kind of have to do it your own way or is there a model that you should follow? It's a blend. You absolutely have to keep some of your own way in it. The last thing we want is a cookie cutter approach to creating businesses. Lots of people have the same ideas. It's the entrepreneurial implementation that actually makes it special and gives it more of an opportunity for success. It's incredibly hard work, especially in the beginning. It pretty much is running your life. And that's why it's so important to think about what is it you're really trying to build that fits you, your family, and again, this enterprise that you're trying to create. All right, Patty Green from Babson College. Thanks so much. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you, Scott. American Public Media. Carmelo Scuderi moved into retirement in 1994 but he couldn't let go of a problem that had irked him for a long time. He felt that the internal combustion engines and everything from cars and trucks to generators were just too inefficient. He thought they could use less fuel and spew out fewer emissions. Carmelo played and played with ideas. He had a promising design on paper. Then he got sick. His son Nick went to visit and discuss the project. He used to say, I'm not ready for the box. And he made it clear to us that when he was sitting in the hospital that he wanted us to take this on and move forward with it. He knew it was going to have a big impact on the world. Nick is one of Carmelo Scuderi's eight adult children. When Scuderi died, they were almost ridiculously ready to carry on. Son Steve says their dad's influence had seen to that. He's half inventor, half entrepreneur, and at the same time, he's all inventor and all entrepreneur. You know, He was very good at both of those things. Steve is an engineer whose interest in protecting his dad's ideas led him to patent law. Another son, Sal, followed Carmelo into engineering and business planning. Nick has experience in worldwide marketing. Angelo handles business development. The eight Scuderi siblings all turned their attention to carrying out Carmelo's legacy, six of them full time. An ambitious startup called the Scuderi Group was born. Almost all the startup team's needed skills were literally in-house. The Scuderi engine's inherent capacity to capture and store compressed air energy has vast implications for the engine market. Along with its Carmelo Scuderi's original drawings outlined what the company calls the Scuderi Split Cycle Engine. Split Cycle Engines have been around for a century, but the siblings say Carmelo's design is unique. They say the Scuderi engine has found a low-cost way to increase mileage and lower emissions. It also captures compressed air and turns it into power in the way current hybrid engines turn braking energy into power. A company promotional video touts this so-called air hybrid design. The Scuderi engine's ability to burn fuel far more efficiently and cleanly, particularly in its diesel version, can benefit the world on a macro scale. With the potential The Scuderi's commissioned an independent laboratory to evaluate their plans. The lab, Southwest Research Institute in Texas, reported theoretical potential but also, quote, significant technological challenges. Southwest is now building two prototypes that will be a major test of the engine's viability. Investors have been voting with their dollars. About 300 Scuderi investors recently gathered for a progress report at the Basketball Hall of Fame in the family's native Springfield, Massachusetts. Small investors have provided most of the Scuderi's $15 million in startup money. The Defense Department threw in $1.2 million. A sign-in list at the event shows the family's backing is heavily local. No investor we interviewed came from more than 50 miles away. Many made it clear that the family's local ties and reputation, plus the engine's potential, drew them in. It was like two and a half, three years ago. And uh, even though it was a shot in the dark, just something about it really grabbed my interest and I've kept with it. Carmelo Scuderi, if he hadn't believed, if he hadn't had the evidence to know that this was going to go, he would have dropped it, gone on to something else. People take risks on things that aren't worthy all the time, and we just thought we'd take the risk on this. And it is a risk. 
Jal Gandhi of the University of Wisconsin's Engine Research Center says the family is part of a very long line of engine tinkerers whose ideas look good on paper. Gandhi says getting a real-world prototype to deliver is often a different matter. Being able to make it and make it work over the wide range of sort of speeds and loads that you see in your car is pretty difficult, and very few things have actually made it past that litmus test. The Scuderis aren't phased by doubters. Nick and Steve say they're betting on the guy who started all this. It's not really us. It was my dad. I mean, he did it before, and I, I know he's going to do it again. This isn't just the Scuderi's unfinished business. Their friends and neighbors are all along for the ride now, too. I'm Steve Tripoli for Marketplace. American Public Media. A computer simulator at a company called Submersion has me playing the role of an army chaplain. It's a training exercise where I'm questioning a troubled young recruit named Billy Parker. Billy's a videotaped actor, and the computer picks his answers based on my questions. It seems like something's been bothering you lately. How are you feeling? I don't know. Nothing's going right. I keep getting into arguments with everyone. Just I'm so mad all the time. The questions are supposed to gauge just how troubled Billy is without driving him away. Billy lets on that he's thought of harming himself. A new question brings more revelations. Billy, help me understand why you're thinking about suicide now. Because my life sucks. Because I'm going home to visit my mom, and i got to explain to her and the rest of the family how I'm such a screw-up, that my wife can't stand to be with me, that she's leaving me. Don't worry, we won't leave you hanging about poor Billy. Submersion got its start in Columbia, Maryland, because founder Dale Olson was a veteran of the Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins University. Hopkins has lots of smart people, a key ingredient in what business folks call an entrepreneurial ecosystem. Dale Olson says those contacts helped his startup from outside when he wasn't big enough to have their skills inside. What I had is really strong people, people who made movies and were willing to stick their neck out to help go a little bit above and beyond, people who wrote software and were willing to put a little extra time in to make sure things were done well and done right. There was a lot of pieces put together. Hopkins' colleagues also helped Olson with computer, editing, and budgeting support. And Olson's many years with those people brought his startup more than brains. I had earned the trust and confidence of the people around me, and so they gave me more latitude than they might have given somebody without having done what I had done. One way they helped? Olson says the Applied Physics Lab didn't insist on timely payment for some services when he was struggling. Joe Hadzima helps loads of startups worldwide through the MIT Enterprise Forum near Boston. Hadzima says stories like Olson's follow a familiar entrepreneurial recipe. The base components in my mind are knowledge and information on how to do an entrepreneurial thing, role models, and the network that allows you to connect with people and ideas and money. Back in Maryland, Olson's startup has a logical customer base among federal agencies. They buy training simulations teaching everything from courtroom questioning to sensitivity to Middle Eastern cultures. My simulation revealed at the end that poor Billy Parker wasn't at high risk for suicide, but before I knew that, I'd extracted a promise. Okay, Billy, tell me your understanding of what we're going to do. I'm going to come and talk to you tomorrow. Hmm, maybe I'm in the wrong line of work. I'm Steve Tripoli for Marketplace. American Public Media. If you want to understand why the planes are coming back, visit 84-year-old Cy Keller. Cy's latest invention is a lot like his other ones. It's all about solving an everyday problem. And then when the fish hits, it'll just ring a little bell. This invention replaces the old hand-over-hand -hand fishing line used by North Country ice fishermen. You set the hook and you're fighting them with a little rod and reel. Keller's made and marketed many ingenious small products, but in the Red River Valley of North Dakota and Minnesota, he's known for a bigger invention. It all started 50 years ago with a turkey farmer who couldn't scoop manure from around the posts in his barns. He brought his problem to Keller's machine shop. After he left, why, my brother and I thought, man, you know, if we could make something that would really turn sharp. It took us probably three, four months before we come up with an idea that it would turn very sharp. The Keller's sharp-turning skid steer loader changed the way work is done on farms and in factories. It also launched the multinational Bobcat equipment line. Half a million Bobcats later, it's still based near Fargo. Today, there's a lot more to the reviving plain states than heavy equipment. Joel Kotkin of the nonpartisan New America Foundation has been studying the region's comeback. The 
revival is concentrated in a series of, you can almost call an archipelago of small cities and towns that are doing quite well. Des Moines, Sioux Falls, Fargo are three very good examples. Kotkin says the stars are aligning for about a dozen plain cities. Unemployment in these places is negligible. Wage gains are outpacing most of America, and they boast well-educated populations, growing tech and energy sectors, plus lots of cooperation between entrepreneurs, government, and nearby universities. In Fargo, electronics manufacturing, like this computerized assembly line, is one new strength. There's biotech. A local software company bought out by Microsoft employs over 2,000 people. Today's comeback businesses trace a direct line from the farmers and ranchers of a century ago. Their descendants moved into crop and livestock science, farm management, and heavy equipment. That's Cy Keller's generation. Then that generation moved its well-schooled kids into biotech, software, electronics, and hard science. This machine provides aeration for the bacteria that contain the DNA that we're growing. If Cy Keller has a spiritual heir today, it would have to be 31-year-old Mike Chambers. His biotech startup Aldevron in Fargo manufactures DNA for vaccine makers. In one part of the lab, a big machine can shake dozens of beakers at once to aerate bacterial cultures. Aldevron has 750 clients worldwide and has been profitable from the start. Mike Chambers says his roots in his family's large beekeeping business put him on this road. Beekeeping is a fascinating industry. So that's sort of what got me into science. And working for my dad and for my grandpa got me into business. And it's funny because making DNA is very analogous to making honey. Chambers says local business people are quick to fund promising startups. This nexus of rising businesses and community-wide cooperation has started paying another dividend. We get a huge sack of resumes every month from people that want to come home. The re-energizing cities of the Plains can now provide good work to both ends of a two-career couple. Then there's another attraction. You can get a great house here for under $200,000. But even with all the good news, the Plains states are still an economic work in progress. Joel Kotkin says the whole region needs an infrastructure upgrade. It needs electric and telecommunications lines, irrigation systems, and better air service. He says the new Great Plains won't look like the old Plains. It's going to be something where there's going to be fewer but more vibrant centers. And those centers could easily be one of the more promising outlets for America's future growth. This is another option for America in the 21st century, another strength that we can play on, something that we have forgotten. We haven't looked at this huge part of the country that is essentially underdeveloped and that has enormous potential that we haven't even begun to tap. Mike Chambers' office at Aldevron used to sport an inspirational picture. Some farmer had turned an old headboard from a bed into a gate. Chambers says that picture reminded him of the daily ingenuity that once made the Plain States grow, and it reminds him of what it will take to make today's budding revival stick. I'm Steve Tripoli for Marketplace. American Public Media. Much of the economy of South Dakota's Pine Ridge Reservation just doesn't make sense. One particular statistic irritates Chamber of Commerce head Ivan Sorbel. It's estimated that $80 million come onto the reservation in any given year, and uh, approximately about 80% of that leaves the reservation within 24 hours. That's because there aren't many businesses on the reservation to capture those dollars. People head straight to border towns to shop. Sorbel says it's bad enough that money doesn't circulate inside a reservation where unemployment's a staggering 60% but it's especially aggravating for such an isolated place. Pine Ridge is the size of Connecticut and has just 25,000 residents in a few towns. Most all are members of the Oglala Lakota Sioux Tribe. Yet people often travel a hundred miles for services as basic as a haircut. You know, the tribe as a whole, it's been a bit of a stretch for them to understand that private entrepreneurship is important. Tribe member Elsie Meeks says small business is missing here because tribal culture emphasizes group advancement, so many still frown on individual profit. But there's a growing number of tribal small business initiatives, and they're paying off. U.S. Census figures show the number of Native American entrepreneurs nearly doubling in recent years. And here's a surprise. Native-owned small businesses collectively generate more revenue than tribal casinos now. In Pine Ridge, one business success story sits high on a hilltop overlooking the town of Kyle. So this is Lakota Express, and we're currently in the 50-seat call center. 
Lakota Express is a modern call center and marketing shop with clients around the country. There's even a client in China. CEO Carlene Hunter is another person who's bothered by how quickly tribe members' dollars leave Pine Ridge. But now, she says, the flight of cash is slowing. That's why first-generation entrepreneurs are taking the steps of, okay, we need stores, we need restaurants. We've got our first motel. I mean, if they stay on the reservation, they're going to buy gas down at the local convenience store. Dollar turns over again. Hunter's fellow tribe member, Elsie Meeks, has a hand in all this. Twenty years ago, she co-founded the Lakota Fund. It offers startup loans and all kinds of training to entrepreneurs and tribal businesses on Pine Ridge. But Meeks didn't stop there. She quickly helped expand the concept into a bigger organization called First Nations Owista Corporation. Owista, a Mohawk word for money, now has a startup fund and entrepreneurship training program that's used by tribes around the country. But the startup game on reservations is by no means easy yet. This is the first part of the store here. Mona Patton owns the bustling Little Angels convenience store in Kyle. Her startup funds came from two family tragedies. Now she wants to build a full-service grocery store and movie theater, but doing that on Pine Ridge means overcoming obstacles most entrepreneurs never face. Water mains, sewer mains. We had to develop the water, the sewer, and the road, and it cost you a lot of money. Funding her own infrastructure isn't the only problem. Tribal laws cloud land rights. That alone can extend the startup process for months or even years. In Pine Ridge, there's an effort to change those laws. So reservation economies still have a long way to go. But Elsie Meek says the nationwide numbers show Indians stirring from the nightmare that started with confinement to reservations. Being taken out of a lifestyle of self-sufficiency, and I mean, it really took away every role people had. So planting this seed that people can become self-sufficient is, you know, been our whole challenge, one of the biggest challenges we have. But now she says more Indians see how they might control their futures. Business ownership is one way. And she says it doesn't matter if it brings its share of the reverses all business people face. The important thing, she says, is that all the consequences will belong to us. In Kyle, South Dakota, I'm Steve Tripoli for Marketplace. American Public Media. Let's puncture one misconception about owning a franchise business right away. In crucial ways, you are not your own boss. Susan Kezios of the American Franchisee Association says you're really not much of an owner either. Understanding from the outset that you are investing your money and your energy to grow someone else's business is key. That will take off many sets of rose-colored glasses. Kezios says most of her association's 10,000 members tell her they're playing against their parent company's stacked deck. She says the small print in many franchise agreements can go way beyond upfront costs. Am I required to buy products and services from the franchise corporation? If so, do they disclose the markups that I'm going to be paying? Kezios says those costs might be called licensing fees, referral fees, or sourcing fees. Call them what you want, but they can add up. Still, there's got to be a reason why 650,000 franchise stores exist. Many franchisees think they can do better than they might in regular jobs and don't seem to mind the costs. Rich Valeriotti's in the garage of the Midas muffler shop he's owned for 13 years. It's near Boston. There are seven more years on his franchising deal, and he has no doubt about what he'll do when it ends. How we know? How we know, yeah. Valeriotti sends a big chunk of gross sales money to his parent company. There's 10% of gross for royalties and advertising. He also has to buy many of his auto parts through Midas at a good markup. And Midas owns his building, so there's a monthly lease. Valeriotti wishes his agreement would let him buy the building. But overall, he thinks it's a fair exchange. Their products that they offer are top-of-the-line products, but they also offer, with that money they make, they offer training to us. We have a website that they develop. So it's almost like you're going in business for yourself, but you have some backing. David Weiss of East Brunswick, New Jersey, owns a coffee and smoothies franchise business called Maui Wowie. Weiss isn't sure he'd do it again. He says the business has taught him a lot about franchising, and he wanted to start out with some of the support a franchise brings. But there have been surprises in his contract. There's a, a clause basically saying, I will keep up to standards. But the broader interpretation is anything we decide to charge later franchise operators on, you have to pay up to, even though it's not in your contract. 
Franchisee Association head Susan Kezio says that kind of add-on after an agreement signed is widespread. She calls it signing a moving target and says it's one of the biggest dangers for franchise buyers. Basically, they find out that they are a captive marketplace for the sale of goods and services. I mean, this is where franchising is no longer free enterprise. It's more akin to indentured servitude at that point. Professor Robert Foskey teaches a seminar for prospective franchise store owners at the Zicklin School of Business in New York. You know, 99% of the time, that franchise contract is going to be written in favor of the franchisor. Foskey says he pounds home to his students that they have to look beyond the franchisor's earnings claims, cost projections, and territorial promises. They also have to do their own industry analysis. That means tracking trends and especially talking to current franchisees, because there's plenty of unrest across the franchising world right now, including lots of franchisee lawsuits against parent companies. But there are also signs things are improving. Franchising is moving toward multi-store operators, a more well-heeled group. They're bringing lawyers and a louder voice for franchisees than mom-and-pop shops. And the International Franchise Association, once a franchisor-only group, now includes franchisees in its membership. I'm Steve Tripoli for Marketplace. American Public Media. I think I'll let the people who've done it be your guides today. Maureen McGinnis and Peter St. Martin own two busy restaurants in Northampton, Massachusetts. They've been business partners for 24 years, marriage partners for 20. In one of their restaurant's bustling dining rooms, they talked about what it takes. Peter first. We definitely had to figure out how to work together and how to live together. I mean, that wasn't easy for the first couple of years. It was a learning process, and we did figure out how to give each other the space that each other needed in order to be able to work together. I think it's going to work out. It's not that we're so great, but it's just that we just keep plowing through, even during the difficult times. And when I can't plow anymore, he does it. And when he can't, I do it. You know, that is really so much strength to run a business with. Peter says once you get that far, the rewards start kicking in. For me, I feel like our relationship has more to it than most people's relationship. Whereas I feel like for couples who go off and work their own jobs, I feel like they don't have the same closeness and respect for each other that Maureen and I have been able to develop. Maureen says business couples should remember two things. Have a passion for what you do and really stop to appreciate life. Out in Akron, Ohio, Sage and Rocky Lewis have run their web marketing firm SageRock.com for eight years. They've been married for ten. Sage and Rocky say spousal business partnerships definitely aren't for everyone. Handling spillover between the two lives is one reason. It's probably either going to work out terrifically or be a colossal calamity. You are integrating things that you have really no idea that are going to be integrated and it, it intertwines your life in a way that is much more deep than it ever had been before. Every time there is a stress in the business, it is a personal stress. You know, it's not just like, oh, you know, things at work are kind of hairy. No, it's like, my life is hairy. So that kind of crossover is sort of magnified times a thousand when you cross your business and your personal lives together. Rocky Lewis says any spousal work partnership has to have a strong personal bond underneath. Because when the chips start falling at work, I mean, if you have any little issues or if you're prone to conflict in your relationship, once you add the work stress on top, I mean, it could just be a house of cards if you're not good communicators. So listeners, do you qualify? Rocky came up with this great litmus test. If you can't go on vacation with your spouse without a big fight erupting, we don't recommend that you seriously consider going into business together because it's not going to work. It's not going to work. You have to just want to always be with that person. And furthermore, you don't want to really be with anybody else as much. I'm Steve Tripoli for Marketplace.
American Public Media. A decade ago, the movie Hackers portrayed a bunch of cyber hip teens who busted into corporate computers mostly to show off. Yes, home run, home run, okay, okay, okay. Just showing off doesn't cut it anymore. Vincent Weifer of Symantec, which makes Norton antivirus software, says a far nastier group has now moved in. Really, we saw a dramatic transition from the old hackers, virus rider era into the cybercrime era occurring at the end of 2004 to early 2005. It was a very, very dramatic changeover. These new bad guys saw big money in attacking computers. They want your personal information so they can rob you, or so they can pose as you and steal from someone else. Or maybe they want to hook up your computer to thousands of others in a cybercrime invasion army called a botnet. Weaver says this group's different in another way, too. Many of them are entrepreneurs coming in. Entrepreneurs without their own hacking skills. What they're about is building a business based on hacking. Dave Marcus of McAfee Labs, another antivirus firm, says organized crime groups worldwide are players. They and others recruit young geeks they find in coffee houses and other hangouts. But they're drafting another cohort, too, college students with more advanced tech skills. And they look to them for a different reason. They're more look to the university students to place them later on down the line in a company that they're going to need insider information on. They will look for a person who's in their second year or first year of college and actually sponsor their education. These dark side recruiters also chase seasoned pros. Gadi Evron is a computer security expert with the Israeli firm Beyond Security. He says he's been recruited twice. The first time somebody just gave me a call out of nowhere saying they hold my resume in their hands and they wanted to know if I'm interested in a job hacking into websites. Evron guessed that these callers were middlemen. He never found out who was behind them. But the next approach was more direct. I was in a formal meeting with very impressive people and they said, um, we are a global firm for private investigations and we're interested in your help. And it became pretty clear over the conversation that they were speaking of industrial espionage. Evron wouldn't name that company, but he says it's pretty clear both ends of these deals know they're breaking the law. And he says people with no special computer skills might be tricked into cybercrime. You yourself, Steve, may get an email, for example, saying, hey, are you interested in, in work from home? or some sort of a 75k a year job. The one thing they don't tell these people is that they'll be arrested in about a week or two. These folks are being used to launder money. For a fee, they transfer stolen funds to Russia, China, or another cybercrime outpost, thinking it's a legitimate transfer. Then they get dumped. Their untraceable sponsors don't care if these so-called money mules are quickly busted. Maybe there's too many garbage files. I need more time. In that decade-old movie, the fictional young hackers track down the evil computer virus and, of course, save the world. They found it! They found it! You should be so lucky in real world 2007. Gadi Evron says most people don't realize how dangerous the Internet has become. Serious-looking websites and emails can be imposters. Celebrity websites, social sites like MySpace, and hot sites like one for this year's Super Bowl have all been booby-trapped. Bottom line? You need to have all your computer defenses up, and you need good ones, because there's no larger solution for fighting these new cybercrime entrepreneurs right now, and they know it. I'm Steve Tripoli for Marketplace. American Public Media. The bite of insurance costs is more dramatic when you see it directly from a small factory's floor. This is the largest of the units that we make, and uh, it's a portable wind choice. Lincoln Precision Machining outside Boston makes hoists and winches for lifting things. The company struggles with costs and competition, but it's holding its own for now. When I first visited the company in 1999, it had 26 employees. Health insurance coverage for a family cost $460 a month back then, and the company paid for all of it. Today, Lincoln's down to 22 employees, and family health insurance premiums have tripled. They're nearly $1,500 a month now and workers pay a share of that, about 300 a month. Of course, this cost is growing far faster than Lincoln's profits. Richard Hallen, the company's vice president then and now, says the pain of paying it has been spread around. It comes in part from lower wages for the employees. I think it comes from lower profits for the corporation. It comes from trying to find new sources for materials. 
On the shop floor, longtime employee Rich Perduta says workers are resigned to both smaller raises and paying part of the insurance tab. It's, it's a tough pill to swallow, but you know you don't really have any control over it. You know, I mean the company's had to pay a lot more also. So, what are you really going to do? Believe it or not, Lincoln isn't far from typical. Since 1999, small business health insurance premiums have risen 125 percent nationally. That's less than Lincoln's 200 percent, but the company's aging workforce is the difference. Many small businesses get extra large premium hikes as their workers age. John Ahrensmeyer, who heads the advocacy group Small Business Majority, says small employers take an oversized health insurance hit in ways beyond price. Many times entrepreneurs can't get health insurance because they're too high a risk. If you run a small business and you get rated just based on yourself or a few other employees, you may be out of luck finding affordable insurance at all. Despite these common problems, the small business community is widely divided over a fix. Gary Claxton surveys health benefits nationwide for the Kaiser Family Foundation. He says small businesses split among those that provide insurance and those that don't provide it or oppose potential insurance mandates for business. Claxton sees national momentum toward broad-based plans like the new ones in Massachusetts and California, where businesses share the burden of insurance costs. But he warns that small business support for such plans can quickly erode in the face of mandates. There clearly will be some business opposition because most of the proposals that we see are, do require businesses to do something. Back in 1999, Richard Hallen at Lincoln Machining surprised me by saying that the country should eventually adopt universal health insurance, not a common view among executives. All the interest groups will fight for another eight or ten years, he said, and then they'll decide it's the least bad choice. Well, he was wrong about the timing for universal coverage, but today he's sticking with his prediction of a national plan someday. I do still think that's the most likely outcome. I don't see a real rational or a real likely alternative to that. John Ahrensmeyer at Small Business Majority doesn't see a government-backed single-payer plan as the only option, but he says small businesses need a system that guarantees access to affordable health insurance. And if part of that system involves businesses paying a fair share, we think that's perfectly reasonable. If the society decides that the solution is a single-payer system, well, then that's another way to go. Of course, that position is directly at odds with many other small business groups. And look around. Big business, labor, and others have their own divisions over health care, which should help you understand why major reform has been so elusive, big price hikes and all. I'm Steve Tripoli for Marketplace.